crossroads. Of course I check out the groundhog holes in Westminster. Hey buddy, I'm gonna love you. I go to crossroads and of course I tell everybody that we're right across the street from town hall. We go to crossroads. Of course we miss the donuts. donuts. I go to crossroads. Of course I've been in a live nativity. We go to crossroads. Of course we don't know where the Eldersburg campus is or how to find it or which door to go in. Help. I go to crossroads. Of course I tell people it's the church behind Wawa. Hey, did you want me to pick you something up from Wawa before church? I go to crossroads. Of course we'd like more people on the parking team. I go to crossroads. Of course I volunteer at Kids Club. Bye. I go to crossroads. Of course I've been to Nicaragua like, I don't know, 452.3 times. I go to crossroads. Of course I pray for one more. I go to crossroads. Of course I've been to the Plastic Palace, which was the pavilion wrapped in plastic for our first Easter service. I go to Crossroads. Of course I started coming for the coffee and donuts, but I stayed for Jesus. I go to Crossroads. Of course I donated a bike to Nico Works. Hey everybody and welcome to Crossroads Online. My name is John O'Contestable. I'm the Eldersburg campus pastor, which is where we are right now. I don't know where you're watching from right now, but I love that the Lord is able to connect us. Apart from time and location, we're bound by something deeper and richer. And so today, it is my hope, it is my prayer, as well as the rest of the staff and leadership here at Crossroads, that you would feel welcomed even where uh, far away, um, that you would feel welcomed and that you would experience God this morning as we worship, as we hear from the message, uh, and as you maybe see some other people. There's a step even for you to take this Sunday. So enjoy this service. We're so grateful that you are tuning in with us. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. I'm Beth Pruitt. I'm Cindy Floor. And we are so happy you're here today. If this is your first time here or your hundredth time here, we feel like we say that all the time, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to connect with you. So we make it super easy. You can text the word here at the number below, and that'll be a great way to find out what's going on at Crossroads. Yeah. So I've been really loving this new series. Right. We're in week two of our series DNA. Mm -hmm. And um, if you missed last week, it's okay. You can just jump right on in. But what we're talking about is, or what they're talking about, is, um, you know, just like every individual has their own unique DNA, so does Crossroads. We um, we are talking about what makes Crossroads Crossroads and what um, just what our actual values are. And it's been great. So what is this week? Are they talking so about? this week we're talking about people over programs. And mm. that one's really important to me. It um, is. I think, uh, you know, anytime that we are putting our focus on the people and yep. not all the stuff behind it. Yep. That's really important. What a great follow-up to last week. We right. talked about everyone being welcome. Yes, so that's absolutely. just, that's great. Absolutely. Do we have anything happening? Yeah, we have some great things going on. First thing is we're in the midst of our spring food oh, drive, yeah. which has been so great. Thank mm -hmm. you for all who have donated. We still have chances to do that. Yes. And this food goes to our community center mm -hmm. right in yeah. Westminster yeah. that serves the local community. So we make it super easy. You could bring the food in mm -hmm. to one of our campuses or there is a link below um, with a shopping list and you could just absolutely do it right through Amazon and it'll right. come right to the community center so we thank you for that yeah absolutely and then of course tonight we have really exciting news if you're a high schooler we are having high school worship night tonight so at great. our Eldersburg campus a night filled with uh, worship and great messages and just being able to maybe make new friends and yep. share share the word of God with with your friends yep. right now so all the details for these events and all of our events can be found on our website and that information is listed below as well. Yep. So. so I guess we're ready for the service. Yes, so. Just pray for the service. Yep. All right. All right. Dear Father, we just want to come to you and say thank you. Thank you for the words that are going to come before us. Thank you for the way that you're going to show us that people matter more than programs and traditions. We are mm -hmm. 
we're just so blessed that you love us the way that you do and that we're going to get to share that with the with our community um, we thank you for all the ways you bless us you love us and you protect us and we pray all these things in your son's name amen amen thanks again for joining us enjoy the service yep. Well, hey, once again, uh, it's me, Jono. I'm so grateful that you're uh, with us for this service. And as we move into a time of offering, there's a bunch of different ways that we can give. But I want to highlight something in Scripture um, before we give, that we would have the right heart posture. Um, when I say heart posture, heart is like at the core of all that motivates us. It's uh, the backdrop for all that we think and say and do. It's what gets us up out of bed in the morning. And, uh, and God is most concerned with the transformation of our heart, not our actions, not behavior modification, but that it would start in our heart and go from there. And, and so when I ask about the heart of God, um, you know, we might have a lot of different thoughts that come to mind. I don't know about your experience, your backdrop. Uh, I don't know what is the foundation of your faith or, or where you are in terms of steps taken. But Jesus actually says one thing about his heart. In all 89 chapters of the New Testament, in four gospel accounts, uh, there's only one time that Jesus pulls back the curtain as to what his heart looks like. And we know that the heart of Jesus is the heart of God. Dallas Willard is who first identified this for so many people. And it's found in Matthew chapter 11, when Jesus extends this invitation, Come to me, all those who are weary and burdened. That is what constitutes an invitation to Jesus. And then he says this, for my heart, uh, my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I am of a gentle and humble heart. That is the heart of Jesus, gentle and humble. And those two things mean that he is drawn to your brokenness, that we think it's the thing that would stop us from going to him, and yet it's the thing that qualifies us to go to him. It's what draws him in that he would see us and be drawn to us. And so when we give in this moment, I, I want us to think about the heart of the one we're giving for and, and, and let that motivate and, and prime the pump of our own hearts in terms of how we give. Um, and we give in more than just money uh, here at Crossroads, but this is an opportunity for money to fuel the ministries and missions that we do. And so thank you for the ways that you think of us and are generous with your gifts. Let me pray for our offering today. Jesus, Lord, we come before you, someone of a gentle and humble heart, and we're so grateful that that's the posture we approach. Lord, that it's in our weariness that you are even drawn to us, not repelled by us. And so Jesus, I don't know how that mystery plays out, but God, right now, I, I pray for the hearts that are preparing to give, Lord, that we would understand the invitation to come near to you the kind of heart we approach, the kind of heart we give for. Lord, so thank you for these things. Thank you for the gifts. We pray and ask all these things in your name. Amen. Enjoy the rest of the service. In the darkness we were waiting without hope or without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophet to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Salvation, Jesus for 
Welcome again, everyone, and uh, welcome to week two of our sermon series that we're calling DNA, and whether you were with us last week or not, this is a sermon series about the core values of Crossroads Church, and, and we think it's super important because just like DNA controls how different we are from one another, what makes me, me, and you, you, the DNA of Crossroads is what makes us us, and and maybe it's hard to see. Maybe it will take you a while to investigate and to to uncover why we do what we do, and so we wanted to spend a couple of weeks uh, here in the spring and talk about this is our DNA. And so last week, we started with core value number one, which is everyone's welcome here. Acknowledging, of course, that many, many churches put that on a sign out in front of of their building. But we looked at how central that one value was for the church that Jesus envisioned. That We called it extreme hospitality, a a radical inviting um, atmosphere. And it's not normal, it's not intuitive, it doesn't come naturally, and sometimes it's not even practical, but it is what makes us different. It is what Jesus envisioned that would make the gathering that bears his name different than every other gathering. So everyone's welcome here. We say, come as you are. Don't stay as you are, but come as you are. Everyone's welcome here. Today, we're going to talk about the second core value, which is people are more important than programs. 
Now, last week we saw Jesus saying that people tend to misunderstand, especially religious leaders, tend to misunderstand what the most important thing is every single time there's a gathering. And the people, Jesus said over and over again, are the most important thing. Uh, Not the setting, not the uh, course of events, not the rules that you follow, none of that. The people are always the most important thing. And so in our context, our our mission as a church, leading people to life-changing faith in Jesus Christ, the people are the point. (laughs) And we lead people to transforming faith. And and, and don't miss this part. Um, Life change is relational, not transactional. In other words, to trust Jesus, we said this a couple of weeks ago, doesn't mean to trust in some arrangement that he's made for us. It means to trust in a person, to be in a relationship with a person. It, it, it's the basics of understanding that the good news is that if I have a restored relationship with God, relational, it changes every other relationship that I have. The whole thing is is relational. That's why, as we think of the purpose and the priorities of a church, sometimes we think about these three vital relationships, that every church that is in line with what Jesus had in mind has spent time in prioritizing these three vital relationships. One, intimacy with God, starting there. To say, your relationship with your Heavenly Father is where it all begins. Intimacy with God then transforms these two relationships. Community with other Jesus followers, that we're not meant to do this alone, that we are built for community, for connecting with other Jesus followers. And third, influence with Jesus seekers. Now let me clarify. These two groups of people include all people, (laughs) either people who are actively following Jesus or people who aren't yet, but who are looking for him, even if they don't know that that's what they're looking for. We see that the church that Jesus envisioned would focus on all three of these key relationships. And if you get any one of them um, way more important uh, or, or left out, it messes the whole model up. But if you miss the whole relationship piece, then you don't get any of them. And it's not what Jesus had in mind. So people and relationships are at the core of what Jesus envisioned his church would be. And so when we say, as Crossroads Church, people are more important than programs, that's what we're uh, refer- referring to. Uh, let me give you a picture uh, of what this might look like. You might have seen, I have a scale behind me. And uh, so we're going to do some weighing of things today. And, and on one side, there are going to be some programmatic things that most churches uh, are availing themselves of today. And we do. Um, important things like video. You're watching on video right now. So video is an important tool when it comes to those three vital relationships. We're using video. So it's worth something. Something else like how many people are watching. That's important to know. How many people are attending in person? That's important to know. We did a a survey a few weeks back. We're going to share some of those results with you. But is that important? Yes, it's definitely important. Even... Something like lights. Don't take it for granted. We, we have lights, camera, action. All of that's in, important. And, and it's a part of, of what we use to do ministry here at Crossroads. But here's the principle. That if you would compare how important any of those things are, together or separate, to a person, Mike or... Abby, Sam, Julie, you, me. 
when you compare any of that to a person, we say the person is more important every single time. No matter who the person is, they're more important than any of this stuff. Now, Jesus lived this out over and over and, and over again um, from the first miracle that he did. Jesus, his very first miracle, when he told his mom, not yet mom, he actually gave into the uh, request of his mom and he saved a young couple from embarrassment because they ran out of wine. He said, uh, the people are more important. And you remember Jesus uh, being touched well, the hem of his garment by a, a hemorrhaging woman, a woman who had spent everything she had and wasn't getting any better. He was on his way to go visit a sick child, and this woman touches his garment, and Jesus stops and says, hold on, people are more important th than any appointment that I have. Or how about just before Jesus goes to the cross, He's uh, walking into a town called Jericho, and there's a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. And Jesus has places to go and people to see and humanity to save. But Bartimaeus is crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And even though the crowd, the crowd says, be quiet. He's too important for you. He's got places to go, people to see. Jesus says, bring him to me. Why? Because people are always more important than programs. Today, we're going to look at, with the time we have left, just one of those other interactions that Jesus has uh, with, with someone. It's found in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 3. Let me read to you Mark 3, verses 1 to 6. It says, another time... Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, Ask them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life? Or to kill. But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and, and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. This is God's word, and in this one little interaction that Jesus has, um, we see the problem with people, all, all people, and we see how religion actually usually makes it worse, and then we see in this beautiful way, maybe a surprising way, how Jesus makes it better. Uh, let's look at the, at the story that... It's, it screams about the problem that people have. The first line is that there was a man who was there in the synagogue, and he was just called the man with the shriveled hand. Now, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I wish we had more details in the Scripture, but sometimes I'm glad that it, the, the people uh, are, are not as specific as maybe they could have been made because that allows me to see myself in these people that interact with Jesus. And I invite you to see this is you. Um, this person with, with no name, just like you and me. It could be you and me. And the, the man with the shriveled hand, we don't know his name, but you know what we know? What's wrong with him? We, we don't know his name, but we know his defect. And this highlights, it's the, it's the problem with us. Of all the things that you could have said about this man, 
The thing that they used to describe him was the thing that was wrong with him. And we do the same thing. We do it to ourselves. We do it to other people. Uh, I'm sure this guy has this one deformity. Maybe he is an awesome business person. Maybe he is a loving dad. Maybe he's a fantastic son. Maybe he is the uncle that every one of the nieces and nephews loves to visit. You could have said all kinds of things about him. But the problem with people is that we tend to focus on, get fixated on the things that are wrong with us and with others. We, we focus on inability rather than ability. And so this is the problem with people. We, we, we all need affirmation from with outside of ourselves to form an identity. It's just the way we were built. You, you can try saying, I don't care what anybody thinks about me for your entire life. See how that works out. It won't work out well because we require, it's the way we were built, um, outside identity building information. And now couple that with this other fact. We all need that and we are all defective. <laughs> we all remember the uh, racks that would say slightly defective. <laughs> we're all hanging in the same department. Slightly defective. And being aware of our defects and needing outside affirmation, we have some strategies. And this is the problem with people. We hide our defects. I imagine this guy trying to hide his hand so nobody would see that part of him. We blame other people or God for the things that we think shouldn't be the way they are about us. Or, and this is more the religious one, we rank them. We rank defects. <laughs> and we go, at least I'm not a blind and deaf guy. I'm just withered hand guy. <laughs> and, and in any one of those coping strategies, the, the problem is that, that we, we tip the scale in a different direction. And we say that people aren't worth as much. People um, are, are, are not worth our time, our, our energy, God's attention. And I don't know this guy's specific story. I'm kind of glad I don't. Uh, I, I do know this. I know that he went to church that day. He went to the synagogue. And m maybe he knew about people like him in the Old Testament. In fact, in 1 Kings 13, there's a famous story about a man with a withered hand who gets healed by God. My guess is he, like you and me, sometimes comes to church and hears other people talk about what God did for them and wonders, why not me? What, what's wrong with me? Why hasn't God done this for me yet? And we begin to tip the scale in an unhealthy way when we view ourselves or other people in this light. So the rest of the story unpacks, what does it look like to right the scale? What does it look like to treat people as more important than everything else? And by the way, how not to? Because we looked at the problem of people. Now let me show you how religion usually makes it worse. We see here the wrong motive, the wrong answer, the wrong heart. Do you see the wrong motive in verse 2? It says that the religious people were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. <laughs> but that shouldn't surprise you. That's just the problem with people wrapped in a religious covering. I'm going to figure out a way to rank my deficiency above yours. <laughs> So that I'm going to accuse you. I'm going to find some fault with you. I'm some, some way that you don't measure up. Because that makes me feel better about my problem. They, they gave the wrong answer. To, Jesus asks what should be a very simple question in verse 4. See what he asks? Is it right to do good or evil? 
Which is lawful? Good or evil? Save life or kill? This should not be a hard question. I'm going good over evil every time. I'm going life versus kill every time. And what's their answer? They remained silent. Wrong answer. This should not be hanging in the balance. This scale. It should be obvious. People. People matter. (laughs) And the heart behind it is what makes Jesus... You want to know what makes Jesus angry? We find it right here. It says, that answer that revealed that heart about the unimportance of people made Jesus angry. Actually stresses him out. (laughs) It says he was distressed and angry. What makes Jesus angry? When people who claim to represent him get this wrong. Get, get this scale, this measuring system wrong. When, when anything, anything made by man and temporary seems to outweigh things made by God, people who are eternal, Jesus gets angry and it stresses him out. And then Jesus, we see, the problem with people, the way religion makes it worse. Can you see that? But then watch how Jesus redeems the whole piece. And it's maybe not the way you would think because it's, it's not um, pleasant at first for the guy with the shriveled hand, for you and me. It, it says Jesus gives two commands to this guy with the shriveled hand. The first command is stand up here in front of everyone. <laughs> And that is the last thing that this guy wants to do. He's there like hiding his hand and just saying, let's just say some prayers, you know, or or something like that. And Jesus says, no, no, stand up here in front of everybody. And do you see what he's doing? Jesus is requiring the opposite of the religious strategy when it comes to dealing with your weakness and your faults. He's saying, Now, don't hide it. Don't rank it. Don't blame somebody. Stand up here in front of everybody. That's the beginning of this healing. That actually is saying this person has immense value. And Jesus says to him, stand up here. I wrote these two uh, truths down. I can't remember who to give them credit to, but they're so good I had to share them. Number one. Shame can be hidden or healed, but not both. Shame. Um, The the way that we deal with our own faults, the way that we feel about them, can be hidden or healed, but not both. Jesus says, stand up in front of everyone. The second thing I wrote down here is, you can only be loved to the extent that you are known. And Jesus says, I know you already. Stand up here. It's it's all right. In fact, it's more than all right. It's necessary in order for me to bring healing. So first command, stand up. (laughs) It's probably the last thing he wanted to hear. Second command, stretch out your hand. Now, this ends up really great. But can I tell you what it sounded like at the moment was harsh, maybe. Was um, impossible is not a strong enough word. Jesus asked this guy to do the, the one thing that he could not do. Do you think he didn't try to stretch out his hand before? Of course he did. But he could have, Jesus, tell me to give more. Tell me to pray more. Jesus, tell me to come more often to church. Jesus, tell me to, no, he he tells him to do the one thing that he actually cannot do. And can I tell you this, his faith journey hinges 
upon trusting Jesus for what he could not do on his own. And so does yours. So does mine. Our, our faith journey is not about our abilities. It's about our inabilities and trusting Jesus. His, his, we, if you would have told this guy, people are going to be talking about you thousands of years from now. And you want to know why? It's your weakness. It's your withered hand that they're going to be talking about. He, that's the last thing he would have guessed. But it's the thing that allowed Jesus to work his miracle. So the second command is, stretch out your hand. And he stretches it out. Do you want to know who, who gets this concept right almost every time? It's the recovery groups. It's the re recovery groups, just they've experienced the necessity and the power of being able to own your weakness and found that in that, there is there's great healing. W one last quote. I, I think this is uh, from a description uh, of a, an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And someone wrote, the recognition and public confession of personal inadequacy opens the door to real transformation. That's why at every AA meeting, they go around at the beginning and they introduce themselves and they say, hello, I'm Mike, Abby, Julie, and I'm an alcoholic. And the reaction is, if you've never been there, hi, Mike. Not, oh, my word. You're a what? It's, it's, it's the power of saying people are not defined by their weaknesses, their inabilities, but they are connected to Jesus exactly in that place where they begin to own that and present it to Jesus to be healed. And, and so, uh, I, uh, we're all in recovery. <laughs> we're all in recovery from sin. Hello, I'm Reed. I'm a sinner. I hope that wherever you are, you said, hi, Reed. Because if you said anything else, it'll make me, you know, go hide again. <laughs> But the, the testimony here, and look, we'll, we'll end with this. The testimony here is not, um, I used to be, um, I used to not be able to, but now I can. And yay me. That's not it. That sounds nice. But really, the testimony is, I still can't. But Jesus can. And I think I'll let him. I can't. Jesus can. I think I'll let him. And that is the testimony of every person that has found hope in Jesus. And our faith in God, our intimacy with God, transforms every relationship whether they are Jesus followers or Jesus seekers who just don't know that that's what they're looking for. So we as a church are going to embrace this idea and live it out in a hundred different ways every single week that people are more important than programs. Um, let, let's pray together that God does the work in us in our intimacy with him that transforms every other relationship and allows us to see and to treat people exactly like Jesus did. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for sending your son so that you could display with skin on the things that are true about your heart. And this one is one that uh, I so desperately want to grow in. I want us together 
to grow in, that we would be transformed by your love for us so that we would love other people in ways that demonstrate they are the most important thing every time we get together. God, I've got a long way to go before my track record looks anything close to um, what Jesus uh, would, would want it to look like. But meet us here right where we are on this journey and transform us into people that look like your son. We pray it in his name. Amen. Well, that was just a great service. It really was. I, I love hearing how we can be focused on the people and not the nitty gritty details of yep. traditions and programs because what matters is people. Yep, and that's what Jesus was always yes. concerned about, right? Yes. So that was just really wonderful. Yeah. And if, again, if you haven't had the chance to connect with us, text the word here to the number below and we would love to, to hear from you Absolutely. and be able to um, keep in touch with you and let you know what's going on. Okay. So thanks so much for joining us today and um, we'll see you soon. See you next week. Bye-bye.